Boy, that was lucky. There's no such thing as luck. There is only the benevolence of God. There is His hand moving on our behalf. There have been times in your life, you know this to be true, where God has moved and you knew it was Him and you have found Him to be faithful.
armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other side. So neither went near the other along the night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and them, and all the Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen, followed after them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord locked down from the pillar of the fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He made the wheels of their chariots come off so that they had difficulty driving. The Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that my waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over sea, and at daybreak the sea went back into its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and the horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them, the Israelites, into the sea, not one of them survived. Yeah, you can give her a little applause for that. <laughs> What do you do when you're between that proverbial rock and a hard place? When you find yourself in a situation that is causing you stress or causing you difficulty or in a lot of cases that's just about every day. There's something that comes along. And I don't know if you're like me, but I grew up in an era when Charlton Heston was Moses. And I can't help but read this passage, but that I see Charlton Heston in that classic Ten Commandments movie standing there parting the jello at the Red Sea. You know, if you, if you read the story, that's how they made that look like the Red Sea parting. It was jello filmed in reverse. So, sorry to blow the, 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 the movie for you, but uh, that's what happened. Now, after the Israelites left Egypt, God directed them to a place called Pith Harriot. And he did a good job with that name, Chris. He's never stuck one. And it was right on the banks of the Red Sea. Pharaoh, of course, realized he released his labor force. A little over a million slaves took part in the exodus out of Egypt. And so he decided to go after them because they lost all their free labor. And when he did, he took as many as a thousand heavily armed chariots and went after them. And the Israelites were trapped between the Red Sea and the Egyptian army, and that is that rock in a hard place situation. Where do you go? You can't go forward. You've got all these people, and the Red Sea is deep. You can't go back because those guys want to kill you. And so they have found themselves in a place where life is tough. This was the definition of a crisis situation. And so when we do that, I'm going to quickly go through... Seven things, and I know that makes some of you nervous because you know I only usually have three or four points, and I get a good 20 or 25 minutes out of those. Don't worry. I'm aware that there's seven points. So we're going to move quickly. And the first thing that you need to remember when you find yourself in a situation like that is your orientation. Realize that God needs for you to be exactly where you are. Remember God. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He orchestrates the events of our lives and the world according to His will and of His purposes. And in verses 1 and 2 of our text, God told the Israelites to go camp right where they were when they realized that they were hemmed in. And by the way, God knew exactly where they were. He told them to go there. God knows where you are today, too. And in Jeremiah 29, he reminds us, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. So remember your orientation. God knows exactly where you are today. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows what you're dealing with. He knows if you're stressed or whether you're dealing with a crisis 
or whether you have a major decision to make or a minor decision to make, he knows where you are. Secondly, is adoration. Be more concerned when you find yourself in the midst of a crisis, be more concerned for God's glory than for your own relief. In verses 3 and 4, God told Moses that he was seeking glory through this situation that he had placed his people in. And when you and I find ourselves in a situation like that, oftentimes the first thing we cry out for is relief. Oh God, get me out of this! But our first cry should in fact be, Oh Lord, how can you receive glory through me and through this circumstance? If we truly trust God, we must be more concerned with His glory than simply getting relief from the crisis. And that, my friends, is spiritual heroism. It is not easy. I realize that this point in particular is difficult, but the Apostle Paul dealt with it. It's recorded in 2 Corinthians 12, where he said, to keep me from becoming conceited, God gave me, and he called it, a thorn in the flesh. Now, we don't know what that was. Was it a physical ailment? Was it a difficult relationship? We, we, we're not sure. But whatever it was, three times Paul prayed, Oh Lord, get me out of this. Remove it from me. Give me relief from this situation. And you know what God's response was? No, Paul. My grace is sufficient. Some of you have been dealing with situations in your lives that have been going on for years, for decades even. And you may have to accept the fact that God's grace is sufficient. Is it sufficient for you today? Is God's grace enough? Then give Him adoration. Be concerned about His glory. Third, there is the attention. Acknowledge your enemy. Acknowledge the crisis. But keep your attention on the Lord. Caught between the Red Sea and the Egyptian chariots, there was no doubt that Israel was in a crisis. And faith does not deny reality. We as Christians do not just think happy thoughts. We don't deny the reality of a situation. Faith knows what real life is. In fact, responding to God in faith is the most authentic and effective response you can give to real life. Some of us know what real life can bring. We know the unpredictability of it. We know the difficulty of it. We know that, let's face it, it's not always happy. I would like to tell you that when I gave my heart to Christ at the age of 12, from that point forward, my life has always been good. You know better, don't you? Now, don't make the mistake of thinking life is not good. Life is good. And like my grandpa used to say, any day this side of the grass is a good day. <laughs> but let's not deny the reality. Faith can handle the reality of life. It doesn't deny it. It doesn't deny the crisis. But it is the best response to the crisis. So, acknowledge it. Acknowledge the enemy that is trying to destroy your life. But keep your focus fixed on Christ. Third, or fourth, relaxation. Have you seen these shirts and posters going around? What do they say? Stay calm and do this. Stay calm and do that. And this is not in response to that. This word of Scripture existed long before those old teachers came out. When the Israelites saw the Egyptians coming in verses 10 through 14, they panicked a bit. And who wouldn't? Sometimes we panic. Sometimes the situation comes at us so quickly that it catches us off guard and our only response is, Ah! <laughs> The scripture says in verses 10 through 14, they were terrified and they cried out to God. That's good. When you're scared, when you're uncertain, when you're doubtful, when you're in the midst of a crisis, absolutely, cry out to your Heavenly Father. 
But then they said to Moses something incredibly stupid. It would have been better to serve the Egyptians back in Egypt than to die in this desert. Really? It would be better to be a slave? It would be better to be whipped and beaten and put through all that, the, the rigors of servitude, than to be out here free, walking according to God's will? Sometimes when we're in the midst of a crisis, we think, I just want to go back to that. But we need to stop and think for just a moment that maybe the good old days weren't all that good. We need to live in the here and now. We can't go back. We can't jump forward. The only thing that we have is now. And so we need to do what Moses told the Israelites to do. Do not be afraid, he says in verse 14. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance of the Lord. Don't be afraid. Stand firm. Relax. Stop a minute. Take a breath. Say a prayer. And let God work. There is nothing more awesome. And we're beginning to see it here among us. There is nothing more awesome than seeing God work. And knowing that it's Him. And we step back and we say, wow. That's amazing. So relax. And let God work. Fifth, there is the peregrination. Aren't you impressed that I know what that word means? <laughs> I had this book in my studies called the Dictionary. I looked it up because I needed another word that ended in T-I-O-N to keep the outline going. Some of you are wondering, what does peregrination mean? It means to walk. That's all it means. It means to keep walking. So when you're unsure, when you're in doubt, when the crisis comes at you, take the next logical step of faith. Just keep walking, like Dory told Nemo, for those of you that are into that one. She said, just keep swimming. But remember what Chris, Chris Kringle told the abominable snowman. Oh, come on, you know this. Put one foot in front of the other. Keep walking. When you don't know what to do next, and many times that happens because while God is omniscient, which means all-knowing, we are not. I don't know what's going to happen in the next moment. And I have forgotten a lot of what's already happened. Can you relate to that? But when you don't know what to do next, do that which you already know to do. What does that mean? When I don't know what to do next, what I need to do is stick to the stuff that God has already shown me. This is a, a principle that came from Dr. Blackaby, uh, a wonderful author that we'll do a Bible study with here in the months to come, uh, called Experiencing God, and, I, and I'm looking forward to bringing that your way. But the idea is, when I don't know what to do next, stick to what I know. It's the old principle that when I was a kid, and my mother would, would take me to a shopping center or a store or something, she'd say, listen, if you get lost, sit down. Stop moving around, and I'll come find you. And that was a principle. So when we're confused, when we're uncertain, just stick to what we already know. When I don't know what to do next, I still know that God wants me to study the Scriptures. I still know that God is, is receptive to my prayers. I still know that He wants me to have fellowship with His people. Those things I know, even if I don't know what to do next. So stick to those things. In fact, the Lord said in verse 15 to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move. Raise your staff, stretch it out uh, in your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. In other words, Moses, go. Stop whining. You know what the next step is. Take it. Sixth, there is the habitation. Embrace God's presence. Now, in verses 19 through 20, that cloud that's described there is a tangible sign of God's presence. And while you and I may not ever see a cloud or a pillar of fire or a bush that's burning but not being consumed, <laughs> we have seen and sensed God's presence. Did you sense God's presence when He began to move among us in this worship celebration earlier, 
Did you sense that His Spirit was honoring us with His presence? This is more than a gathering. This is God's church. And when His people gather, He notices and He moves among us. And when that happens, we must embrace it. God is here. God's presence is moving. I can sense it. I can feel it in my spirit. In fact, even when I can't feel it, Jesus promised, I will never leave you. Never. Now, if God is with us, He is also for us. Paul said it this way. If God is for us, who can be against us? God is in the moment you're dealing with right now. Embrace that. Even if that's all you've got to cling to, cling to God's presence. And then seventh, there is completion. Trust God because He delivers. He always comes through. There's not a one of us sitting here today, no matter what we're dealing with, who can say, God has failed me. Not really. You may be angry, you may be hurting, or grieving, or struggling, or wondering, or maybe it's been a while since you sensed His presence. But no one can say, God has failed me. And in verses 21 through 31, we read that the deliverance of Israel is complete, and the destruction of Egypt is overwhelming. Exactly, by the way, the way God said it would be. God moves in some awesome and amazing ways on behalf of His people. Many of you have seen it. You've seen a situation, and because you're a person of faith, rather than saying, boy, that was lucky. There's no such thing as luck. There is only the benevolence of God. There is His hand moving on our behalf. There have been times in your life, you know this to be true, where God has moved, and you knew it was Him, and you have found Him to be faithful. Paul said, I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to deliver. 2 Timothy 1. Trust in God. He does, in fact, deliver. And so, what do we do with this? Well, I have a bonus. There's another T-I-O-N word that comes straight out of Scripture, and this is our point to ponder today. Exhortation. The entire content of Exodus 15, which I will not read, I hope you'll read it later, is the lyrics to a song that Moses and the Israelites sang upon making it to the other side of the Red Sea and watching all the things that God did on their behalf. When God moves, we should give Him credit. When He blesses us, we should praise Him. When we come to a Sunday morning and we know that God has been faithful all through the week, no matter what kind of week it's been, we should worship Him. That is, in fact, the essence of worship. We praise God for who He is and we thank Him for what He has done. And so exhortation is the last one of those things. And I wonder today if you have found yourself between that proverbial rock and a hard place. Are you feeling a little bit like one of the children of Israel? You've got this nasty Red Sea in front of you with no place to go, and the Egyptian army coming down your back. Maybe you're feeling hemmed in. Maybe you're feeling stressed. And you want to cry out and say, Lord, move in this situation. May you have glory. Give me wisdom so I can make the right decision. Because wrong decisions made in panic only make situations worse. Have you learned that? So Lord, help me relax and trust in you and watch you move. And when you do, I will give you glory. What well, takes the biggest thing that's got you down? It's standing up right next to God. Anyone can see who's bigger now It don't take no astronaut So don't be scared Or afraid Jesus is your friend Oh, it's 
Won't you come and open wide? 